Well, thank you for this, um, this invitation to this very enjoyable uh, and interesting meeting. Um, and congratulations to Maxime on his coming birthday. Well, this, will, this is a, um, a talk aimed at, at non-specialists, and it will mainly be about formal differential geometric aspects of uh, sort of Kähler geometry uh, in particular the study of things related to Kähler Einstein metrics and constant scalar curvature Kähler metrics and as, as we'll see, certain related uh, uh, objects of, of, of different geometric interest. So let me um, sort of remind you of the basic uh, sort of setup we want to think about. Uh, if we um, have, say, an algebraic variety, the polarization, the positive line bundle V, uh, we want to, um, if, if we <coughs> consider Hermitian metrics on this bundle, whose uh, curvature form is a positive form, the Kähler metric, so H will be our bundle metric, and this gives a curvature form, say omega H, which we want to assume is positive, uh, then we can... Um, we would like to consider the, uh, the problem of finding an H such that the scalar curvature of this metric is constant. This is, this is, the, this is the scalar curvature, which of course is the, the trace of the, of, of the Ricci curvature, which our writers Rho, this is the Ricci. We, we think of the Ricci curvature as a 1-1 a one, one form, just like the, the metric tensor. <clears throat> so this is, this is the, the general problem of the existence of these things. Can we find such an H? Uh, and this is a, this is a, um, a fourth order partial differential equation for the um, the, the, the metric H, it, H is locally represented by a single function. This is a fourth order partial differential equation. That function. Because we have to take two derivatives to get to the, to the metric, and then the scalar curvature depends on other two derivatives. So a, a special case of this setup is when uh, the, um, the first churn class of our manifold is a multiple of the first churn class of our line bundle. But we'll just consider the case when it's a, a, a positive multiple there. In fact, we can suppose that they're equal. So we can actually suppose that the L is the dual of the canonical bundle of V. This is just the, the Fano case, as uh, <coughs> discussed in a different context in uh, Paul Seidel's lecture. <coughs> so then we could write down the 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 the, 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 the Kähler Einstein uh, 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 condition, which is is that, that the row is uh, the, the Ricci form is equal to the metric form, say so rho of omega h is equal to omega h. But this, this can be written in a, um, a much simpler way. 
this, this, this thing, which is on the face of it is a, a fourth order differential equation, just as here, can be reduced to a, a much more tractable looking second order equation in the following way that um, if we just algebraically, if we have a metric on the dual of the canonical bundle, that determines a simple algebra at each point, a volume form on the manifold. So H goes to, say, capital omega H, the volume form. That's to say, if, uh, a way of saying it would be a metric on this line bundle gives a metric on the dual bundle. So you take a form alpha of length 1 with respect to that metric, and then the volume, the, 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 the volume element is alpha wedge alpha bar. So this, this equation here is, in fact, equivalent to, uh, to solving just the, the simpler equation that the volume form omega h is equal to some constant multiple, which we can normalize to be 1, to the, the standard volume form, the sort of Riemannian volume form, given by our metric tensor. <coughs> So this is this is a, this is a second order PDE. So of course, clearly, if you if you solve if you solve the the, the, the Einstein equation, that the Ricci form is a multiple of the metric. When you take the trace, you get constant scalar curvature. A, um, <coughs> slightly more, a less obvious fact is that the converse is true. If, if you're in this situation where just the, the topological conditions you're considering here are satisfied, then any metric with constant scalar curvature would also satisfy this a priori stronger condition. So let me just remind you of how the proof of that goes. So in case two, uh, we, we have, we, we, what we always have is a, is, a, is a Kähler identity, which says if we take d bar star of the Ricci form, then that's equal to taking d of the trace of the Ricci form, which is just d of s. So if you have um, constant scalar curvature, is always equivalent to saying that the, the Ricci form is a harmonic form. So let's maybe so s equals constant is equivalent to rho is harmonic. Well, that's always true, whether in, in whatever case. The point about case two is that in case two, uh, the cohomology class of rho, which represents the first churn class of the manifold, is equal to the, the cohomology class of omega. So by uniqueness of harmonic forms, since, since the, the metric form is, is always harmonic, we can deduce that, uh, that uh, rho is equal to omega. As we know the harmonic form in the class of the, the Kähler metric itself. So actually, in this, in this um, Fano situation, in a sense, you could study either equation, and you know you're studying, in the end, the solutions are the same. But the, 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 the framework for the equations is somewhat different. So in this, in this special uh, Fano situation, there's a, um, a functional, which is important in the theory, which was uh, called the Ding functional. Uh, 
uh, which is, well, the, in the, we'll introduce a slight variant of, 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 a, of, a, of a normalized functional in, uh, later, but, but the, the, the important part of it is just that we just do, we just take, let's say, d naught of our metric H. This is just the logarithm of, um, of the integral over V of this form omega H. So it's a very simple thing. If we, if we, if we, have our, if we choose some reference metric, H naught, and we write H is, say, e to the phi times H naught, then this is just, so everything, our sort of variable is this function phi, then this thing is just, is just the log of the integral of e to the, the minus phi, it works out, times um, omega h naught. 2 phi? Maybe 2 phi? Or ah. uh, I think it's all right. I think, I think it's, yeah, yeah. I should say that this will be a talk with random signs, so probably random factors of two. So if you get, to get them one right, you might as well get them all right, and that's a lot of work. So, so I think that's, but I think that's the right sign. In any case, this is a very simple function. It's just the integral of e to the minus phi. Um, and this was, this was introduced, I think, in, by, by, by Ding in perhaps the uh, 1980s or something, around about then. Uh, but re relatively recently, it was discovered by Benson, by Benson, that this function has a, um, is, is convex in a certain sense. Oh, D not. Convex. In a sense that I will recall later on. And um, this has this ha this this is a, this is a very important point in the theory uh, for reasons I'll try to um, to outline. But I so really I only have time in the talk to just talk about as the formal setup without trying to go into more the analytical aspects of why these things are used. But what's, let's see what's what's um, one one reason why this is. But this balance and convexity is uh, such a good thing, is that because this is such a simple functional, it can be defined in situations of very low regularity. We don't, we don't need this to be a smooth, you know, we, phi can be a long way away from being smooth in order to define this. So the, but one virtue of the Ding functional, as appared, compared to other things we're going to mention, is that it can be defined in situations where we have we want to consider metrics of low regularity, or more generally, where the space we're working on is not actually a, a manifold, but some kind of singular space. Uh, the theory developed by Benson and other people working in that kind of pluripotential theory direction extends all these ideas to singular spaces, and that's technically very important. But it's rather crucial for the, all that extension depends rather crucially being upon in this sort of second order framework as opposed to this more general fourth order framework. So what this, um, the question that this talk aims to answer is how to fit uh, all this, uh, these developments into a certain standard framework, which I'm explaining. We want to fit this. These ideas into a, a So that's what I'm going to try to explain how this can be done. Um, so I should say that actually there's, there's, there'll be minimal new content in a sense in what we're 
going to do. What, what we're going to do would be looked at critically, say we're writing down Bernstein's proof in a different notation. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's a point of view, this, this framework to me is at least is a, a useful point of view which unifies what one's doing uh, with various other situations and also points as we'll perhaps be able to indicate at the end of the talk towards uh, constru constructions one might not have thought of otherwise related to Ricci flow and similar things. Mm. Um, I should also say this is this, um, an old manuscript, of Gra unpublished manuscript of Graham Siegel going back to the 1980s, I think, uh, which I managed to uh, not throw away of all these years, <laughs> which is somewhat related to this. This is this is in the this is in the context of the days when Quillen did a calculation in for this kind of Riemann surfaces, complex dimension one, and then Graham wrote this uh, like this slicker version. But I don't, I don't really have a way of explaining how it's. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is directly related to Graham's construction. So I'm, I'm not. I say this is really an expository talk. I'm not trying to say that I'm doing anything really exciting and, and novel, generally speaking. But I hope, but I hope this, the point of view may give a way of, especially for non-specialists, to kind of understand some of these things. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is to try to explain what I'm, indicate what I mean by this standard framework. So what I mean here is we want to consider the, the, the standard framework with respect to a group acting on a, uh, on a Kähler manifold, preserving all the, uh, the structure, both the complex structure and the symplectic structure. So G acts on Z omega, so this is a Kähler manifold by holomorphic isometries. So we should think of we should think of for the moment think of G as a compact Lie group. Uh, in a moment, we'll be extending the ideas to other infinite dimensional analogies. But think of this as a omega. Omega is the, simpl the symplectic well, a Kähler form on a, a space. So before you define a form, a volume form. Oh yeah, that's right. Maybe it's a bad notation. What else? Sigma. So this, but this, so forget all about this. Is starting. This is a. Forget all about that. This is just saying we have a, a Kähler manifold and a group action. So we want to. Um, so the 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 um, the relevant object, as I recall, is that uh, under favourable cases, uh, we'll assume there is a there's a moment map, an equivariant map, from Z to the dual of the Lie algebra of G. Which is just uh, this is just the generalization of the concept of a Hamiltonian, which should, if you had if G was a circle, say, then we would know that the action would be generated by a Hamiltonian function. This is just the the uh, generalization. It's to say, just to fix our notation, at a point in Z we have the infinitesimal action, which I might just say rho sub Z, um, the derivative of the moment map, the, the, the moment map is characterized by saying its derivative corresponds to the adjoint of rho when we identify the tangent bundle with the cotangent bundle using the symplectic form with a suitable sign convention. Z 
then the, the basic uh, principle in this setup is that on the one hand we can consider the we can consider extending this action to the complexified group. So GC acts holomorphically. said. And we can compare the, the, um, the what's called the complex quotient, that's to say, looking at the, the, the set of orbits of the complex group in Z. Think of it as a compact group. I mean, if, it, if, it's act, if this is a fine dimensional manifold and it's acting by isometries, a compact manifold, it better be a compactly group. We will just have to verify that we have the structure piece by piece. But for the moment, think of this as a compact group. So the, the, the basic thing is we, we, we will compare the, the, the complex quotient Which I just as a, just as a set, the, uh, this thing with the symplectic quotient, which is given by looking at the the zeros of the moment map, um, which is a G invariant set, and dividing by G. Um, so the, 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 the general idea is that these things will not be precisely the same, but if we restrict to a set of stable points in our manifold, to find if, we, if, if we leave out some sort of exceptional or bad points in Z, then uh, these things will match up. That's to say, inside the orbit of a stable point, we'll be able to solve the equation mu equals zero uniquely up to the action of G. <clears throat> so I, I don't really want to take the time to go into saying too much about reviewing too much of the detail about that. Uh, but just to say, in this situation, there's always a, um, a certain convex function, which one is relevant. So fix an orbit, fix a GC orbit, uh, say GC times some Z naught in Z. Then we can define a function unique up to a constant, defined by its, terms, its derivative, that if I, let's use the following notation, if I, if I make a, if I make a infinitesimal change in Z, given by applying an element, like that, obvious, I hope that notation makes sense, then, then the change in F will be given by the pairing between delta G, or I times delta G, and mu of set. So essentially we're saying that we rotate this moment map uh, by a factor of i and then the, that gives the derivative of a function on gc but actually this is, g, this is g, g invariant so it induces a function f from symmetric space GC over G to R. And this always has the property that it's convex from the And the, 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 the critical, so this is a convex function, which you can write down. The, uh, the, the, the critical points, which are just going to be the minima, because the convexity, um, so the, the, the minima correspond to solutions of mu equals zero. So 
So that's to say the um, the problem of the problem of understanding the, this identification. That's the pro that's to say that's the problem of solving the equation mu equals zero in a GC orbit. Once we fix our orbit, it's a question of understanding whether this convex function has a has a has a minima or not. So this is this is convex in the sense of the, the geometry of this um, symmetric space, where it's convex along GAD6. In, in the, with respect to the standard structure. So for example, if, um, if G was SU2, GC would be SL2C, this thing would be you identify with hyperbolic three space, and this would just be in convex. We have a function on hyperbolic three space, which is convex along GAD6 in the ordinary sense. So maybe that's all. We could, I could try to explain a bit more about the standard picture, particularly the relation with stability. But I think that will mean I don't have time to get to the main points. So I'll just leave it at that. What we, what we would like to identify, we'd like to fi fix these ideas into a situation where we have um, a group acting and a moment map, and such that the equation we're trying to solve is the equation that the moment map is equal to zero. Let's leave it, leave it at that. Um, one sort of understands, at least conceptually, how that is related to notions of stability and so forth. So to, what we want to do is to put, so how can these, these questions be related to this, be put into this framework? So the first question involving this constant scalar curvature, this is something which I've um, I said, been, been, been well known for many years. I've given talks about that for many years, um, but not so much the second question. So that's what, that will be what is new in this talk. But let me nevertheless uh, review what, what one would say in, the, in regard to the first question first. And what we want to recall <clears throat> is a bit of standard facts, uh, some standard facts about a homogeneous space called M, which is the, um, so, so let's, let's, let's put it this way. Let's suppose we have a, <clears throat> a, a two n dimensional real vector space called U with a symplectic form. <clears throat> and so let's let M be the set of, um, uh, complex structures, just in the linear sense, on U compatible with omega. So this is this is the uh, homogeneous space uh, SPNR over UN, because the symplectic group, obviously, easy to see, acts transitively on these complex structure, almost by definition. The unitary group is the stabilizer of the standard one. <clears throat> so all we want to say for the moment is that this, this homogeneous space has a, has a standard, has, a, has an SPN R invariant Taylor structure. Okay, this 
the structure of a complex Kähler manifold. <clears throat> so we'll, in, a, in a, a few minutes, we'll come back to, rev to review uh, more specifically how to write, one can write this down. Um, but let's leave it at that. Well, except just to say, for example, if n equals 1, this would be SL2R over U1, which is, um, this is just the hyperbolic plane. So you think, you think this is in, in, in any of the models of the, either the, the disk or the upper half space model, the hyperbolic plane. So we're certainly familiar with the fact that this has got a, a natural Kähler structure. <clears throat> but let's, let's uh, we'll say we'll come back to review more specific formulae um, in a moment. But let's explain how this sort of fits into our story. Now, now we'll go to our, let's take a, let's take a, um, Let's take a, we, we take a compact symplectic manifold with a fixed symplectic form and also with a, with a line bundle, which is still called L. <clears throat> so X symplectic, so this is omega compact symplectic. This is line bundle with connection with curvature minus i omega. So let's suppose we have that. Then at each point of x, we have a copy of our, sort of our space m uh, given by taking u to be the cotangent bundle of, uh, at our points. So uh, we, get a, we get a space mx compatible complex structures on, say, T star x. And we get a bundle, a underlined m over x with fiber m. So that uh, sections of this bundle are just compatible almost complex structures. Then the, um, the Kähler structure on the fibers of this bundle define, at least in a formal sense, a Kähler structure on the infinite dimensional space of sections. That's to say, a picture. We have a we have a section. A, 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 a tangent vector is given by sort of a vertical vector field. Uh, if we want to multiply by i, we just use the, the complex structure on the fibers to do that. If we have two vector fields and we want to define the symplectic pairing, we use the, the structure on the fibers to define a pairing at each point. Integrate over the manifold with respect to the standard volume form of our our metric. So let's let not write all that down. <clears throat> so that's that's going to be our space Z in this in this situation. So of course that's why I didn't want to try to fit any precise statements because now we, we have infinite dimensional spaces where we're just trying to develop the formal picture at the moment. <clears throat> What is the group? So G, <clears throat> this is uh, essentially the symplectic diffeomorphism group, uh, except we can, we'll keep the line bundle in the picture. So G is the group of uh, automorphisms of L as a line bundle with connection, but not necessarily covering the identity map of the base. So such things will preserve the curvature, so in particular they'll give symplectomorphisms. Um, so this is just an extension of the symplectic diffeomorphism group by the circle by giving the, the way you lift the action to L. 
but it means that the Lie algebra of G is um, the whole space of functions, because we haven't thrown away the, we don't have to divide by the constants. So this is all tell. Write, that, write it in that way. So um, G matched to S div of X omega. And the, the Lie algebra of G is the functions on X. So that's good. We're in, our, we're in this sort of standard picture, at least if we're willing to allow infinite dimensional spaces. What you find, indeed, is that the moment map for, uh, so that this maps into, well, you can think this is a space of so volume forms, so the mu, if we identify, if we, if we use the, this is this way, if we, if we use the, the L2 in a product to identify the functions with its dual, uh, loose sense, then uh, the, the, the moment map mu is given by the, the mu of j is equal to the scalar curvature of j. Um, but we can, so it's right, it's right to say mu naught. We can always change the moment map by adding a, an element to the center of our group. So we, we, we take the normalized moment map, but mu of j would be the scalar curvature of j minus the average value of the scalar curvature, which is just a, a topological invariant. <coughs> so the problem of solving mu, mu of j is equal to zero, that's just saying the scalar curvature is equal to its average value. That's just saying the scalar curvature is constant. So, so mu minus one of zero is equal to constant scalar curvature metrics. This somewhat, this somewhat um, yeah, it slightly removed, ignores some technicalities. But um, if we want to go back to the problem we were originally interested in, where we want to, we want to look at a subset of this. So let's, let's say Z, the gamma of M. Set of all almost so we have a subset say z int the integrable almost complex structures. So in fact, for the problem we started with, we're only really interested in this the subset given by the the integrable almost complex structures. And so. Um, Indeed, we can look at finding the constant scalar curvature metrics as fitting into this, <coughs> this framework. OK, so I, I want to push on now to get, to get to the main point. Um, so the point is that how, how do we see how do we see, um, we, in, in this framework, we don't see anything special about the kähler einstein situation. We don't see the Ding functional, anything like that. We don't, this is all. So, So in the Fano case, we can study a different Kähler metric on the space of, this space of integrable, almost complex structures. So let's go back to a review in more detail about our familiar fine dimensional homogeneous space M. We can think of this as, a sub, as, as, as an open set in the set of Lagrangian subspaces 
of uh, lambda n of our vector space u complexified the sort of, uh, sorry, of uh, we take Lagrangian subspaces in u tends to c. In other words, if we have a complex structure, then we can uh, take the usual space. We, we, we have the zero. We have the z the zero, one, and one zero parts of the complexification. And these are Lagrangian, we fix on, say, the one zero space is a Lagrangian subspace. Uh, so as such, but it can be identified by the, the Plucher embedding in the, the projectivization of the, the middle exterior power. So we can we could we can consider a bundle, say m hat over m, which is just going to C star bundle, which is just going to be the corresponding subset subset of um, these forms, just essentially the decomposable forms. So this is just consists of the forms that are equivalent to in the standard model to the decomposable form. Dz1 to Dzn times a constant. Okay. <clears throat> so on this, this middle exterior power, we have a natural Hermitian form. Some normalization that comes in depending upon the dimension. So let's define alpha bracket beta is, so this is Cn alpha wedge beta bar, where Cn is chosen such that um, if I take alpha, let's call this thing alpha naught, say. So that alpha naught, alpha naught is equal to the standard volume form. So to Cn. So we, Right, normalization with respect to dimension. So this then becomes a, a Hermitian form on this exterior power. So supposing I have, a, I have an alpha in M hat. Um, so I look at the tangent space of M hat at the corresponding point. That contains uh, alpha. So it could, because, it, because this is a cone, this thing contains alpha. So it contains C times alpha. Um, but but the, the basic fact we want to recall is that if we take this Hermitian form, which is, which is indefinite on the, the big space, um, if I restrict it to the tangent space of M hat, it becomes negative definite on the orthogonal complement of alpha naught. So in fact, it has signature one comma, what the dimension is. So basic fact, is alpha <coughs> negative definite on the orthogonal complement of alpha in T. At alpha. That's to say, if we have any, if we have any beta in uh, 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 saying that in the tangent, this thing, then um, if I remove the component along alpha, which is some formula like this, then that thing is negative and zero if and only if beta is a multiple of alpha. So this gives one way, one standard way, of defining the, in, the, uh, the invariant metric on M. Uh, we have this indefinite metric on M hat but it's negative definite orthogonal to the fibers. So with a suitable normalization, if we, do, if we normalize by dividing by an extra power of the length of alpha, this induces a metric on, on M, 
which would be well, negative definite with our conventions. So it, this is a metric on M. But now we can make a similar construction in this infant dimensional situation. So now let's suppose that let's suppose that um, C1 of x we're just in the sense of the first shared class of any almost complex structure is equal to C1 of L. Um, at each point in x we, we're going to have a we're going to have Let's write it something like this. That x in uh, we're going to do the, the corresponding thing, but tensored with our line bundle L. That x <coughs> because because if this is projective, we don't we don't care if we tensor our vector space with a, a one-dimensional space, our, our space of forms as so defined as above. So we get a, and so we get a bundle, so M um, fiber X with fiber this slightly extended space. And this, this, is, this is precisely the condition that there is a, there is a global section of this bundle. So it implies the existence of So such things are going to be so we, such things are going to be alpha forms alpha. These are these are n forms on X with values in this line bundle. Um, which at each point lie inside this special this special decompo for, or these decomposable forms. And just topologically, there are such things. Uh, but the, the integrability condition fits in very simply in this way. So say lemma one. So if we let, say, gamma j hat, what did I call that thing? Z int, I call it. So Z hat int. This is the set of alpha sections of this bigger space where the if we can take the the covariant the exterior derivative on the n forms to find coupling to the connection on l but this thing is a c star bundle over our previous space said That's to say, if we have a, an integrable, almost complex structure, which is a section of the space underlined M, we can lift it up to a solution of the, to a section of a form, values in L, in this section of this bigger space, uh, solving this e equation, the coupled exterior derivative is zero, and that choice of lift is unique up to an obvious constant multiple. Well, in fact, th this, this just essentially encodes one of the standard forms of the integrability condition. So I'm not, uh, let me not, time is running short, so let me not say anything else about it.
Mm. More, more. Rabbit is a lemma too. So. so let's let now, supposing I have alpha uh, in, alpha in this. So I have such a form. Uh, I can consider the tangent space at alpha of this, um, this space. So this is the tangent space to z int at alpha. So it consists of, so this consists of forms beta such that they're closed in this sense. And also at, at each, so, so the line satisfy the, the, the appropriate algebraic condition at each point. So at each point, they lie inside the tangent space of the corresponding finite dimensional object. So we can we define a we'll define a um, permission form on such thing, given by just uh, integrating with the, the construction we made pointwise. Well, let's just say, say, say beta one, beta two. Um, this this thing is a this thing is a volume form. <laughs> So we can integrate it over x. So lemma two, which is really the crucial statement, is that it's the same, the same statement really as we said in the fine dimension situation. So lemma two says that this thing is negative definite on the orthogonal complement of alpha in this tangent space. So we have this, this Hermitian form on the space of bundle-valued forms, but which has got no particular, it's completely indefinite. The crucial point that when we restrict to these particular forms, which are both closed in the sense and also because of an algebraic condition, then um, well, orthogonal to alpha, we have this, this form becomes negative definite. So given lemma two, then we, in just the same way as we've discussed before, this metric on this, uh, this the total space of this C star bundle induces a metric on our space of integrable, almost complex structures. Just, just in just the same way as we said before. So from number two, we get an, we get an induced with our sign convention negative definite because we can multiply it by minus one the positive uh, Kähler structure on this space Z int. So the point of the, which is, all I have time is to say the main point and then stop. The, the, the point of the talk is that if we use this metric on this one, so this is, this is something we can only do in the Kähler, in the sort of Fano world, uh, but if we use this metric, then we get, we fit into this standard framework in a way which is adapted precisely to the Kähler Einstein structure, and for example, the Ding functional convexity becomes an example of the general convexity we have in this sort of framework. Um, as I said, that's a bit of a cheat to say it that way, because the proof of lemma two is really a disguised form of Vance's calculation proving the convexity. So, uh, but I think, it's, I think this is a, an efficient way of understanding uh, what's going on. Unfortunately, I was, I was going, hoping to, to do the proof of lemma two, which is 
not, not very long, but I don't quite have time to do it. Uh, okay, so let's, so let's just see what, how, let's, what we do have time to do is to see why, how the moment map comes about. But what is the action? So what, what is the, the action of the Lie algebra of our group C infinity of x on, um, well, first of all, let's take all, of, all the, the n forms with value in L. Um, what you do when you, when you have a, a Hamiltonian, what that enables you to do is to give a lift of the, the symplectomorphism on the base to the line bundle, but you need to multiply in the line bundle by the Hamiltonian. So what happens is that you get the ordinary formula. So let's call it, say, Rh of R alpha of H, so intestinal action. This will be the ordinary formula we'd have involving the, the Lie derivatives. So the, we take the Hamiltonian vector field, close point to H, uh, contract with D of some of, of any alpha um, plus the other thing, uh, d of vh contracted with alpha. But the way the line bundle comes in is now we put in plus ih times alpha. But let's, so what would the, so in this situation, see we just, we just got an action on a vector space with a fixed Hermitian form. So it's very easy to understand the, the geometry. The, the moment map is just given by, find the right page of my notes. So the moment map. So this is a map from our space. So it takes alpha to the element of the dual of the Lie algebra. So it takes h to just the pairing between uh, this thing, the infinitesimal action, R alpha of H uh, with, a, with alpha. So this is just the integral of, but now let's specialize to our situation where uh, our, our form alpha is in the situation we're considering. That means that D alpha is zero, so we lose that term. So we just get D of VH contracted with alpha plus IH alpha, this thing. Uh, but now we can integrate by parts to write the term involving the exterior derivative in terms of this, but because D alpha is zero, that goes out as well. So in the end, we just get the very simple thing, the factor of I, which somehow should have been taken away. So in the end, we just get H alpha alpha. Using, the, using uh, the facts we know about. Well, uh, yeah. uh, using, using, using the fact that alpha satisfies this condition, that its exterior derivative is equal to zero. So that, that's to say the moment map, so mu naught of alpha is indeed just given by the, the, the volume form determined by alpha, which unravels into being the correct thing um, to define with respect to the Ding functional and so forth. So this is quite different, you see, from the moment map in the other situation, which was given by the scalar curvature, which is a much more complicated thing involving taking derivatives. Uh, using this different metric, we get a much um, well, a significantly different conceptual picture to work with. Right, but that's, I have to stop. Question? Well, I'll try to In fact, I had some fantasies years ago, almost in the same direction. Yeah? Uh, you know, Brom of theorem that 
Uh, it's very simple to work with a group of CP2, it's more to be put into a uh, group, and it should be kind of such as analog of uh, patcher conjecture that are a different reason group of S3. Uh, rotation group, and then one can in general ask what a classifying space of simple electromorphism groups. And if I got not confused in this science, uh, I thought more about varieties of surfaces, complex surfaces of general type uh, in symplectic sense. Uh, and the conjecture is this simple electromorphism group should be more the space of complex structures on surfaces. Is it it should be related, obviously, yeah. Some, yeah, in some, yeah. Exactly it, should be, it, should, it should be related, yeah. 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 Other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Simon again.